Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, invitation to speak in this session. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is the different ways in which quaternions enter into differential geometry. And um, what I study specifically is what, what's called hyperkähler geometry. And uh, hyperkähler geometry it appears fairly naturally in a lot of different areas in, in mathematical physics, in uh, you know, quantum field theory and uh, string theory, um, different sorts of uh, moduli spaces, uh, in spaces parameterizing uh, uh, solutions of different physical equations like instanton equations, monopole equations. A lot of the spaces parameterizing uh, solutions to these equations have natural quaternionic structures and they, they turn out to be hyperkähler manifolds. Um, so I'm going to describe hyperkähler manifolds toward the end and I'm going to describe some of the different kinds of uh, quaternionic uh, manifolds um, at, at the beginning. Um, so first of all, um, if you're not familiar uh, with what a manifold is, in, in differential geometry you can describe an n-dimensional space, uh, geometric space, by uh, taking pieces of, of Rn. So these, um, you take these, these, these pieces of open subsets of Rn, like this, and then you sort of glue them together in some way uh, to get to your n-dimensional space. So this is, this is the, n, the, the manifold is this n-dimensional space, and um, you know, locally you have these, these uh, for local charts which are parameterized by, by n, n uh, variables. So, and then they, they glue to, but, but maybe this doesn't extend globally. The whole thing is not just uh, Rn. It's, it's more complicated than that. But at least locally, you have these little pieces of Rn that, that can be glued together in some way. And um, the gluing is very important. If you're, if you're just interested in, in studying this as a, as a topological manifold, then it's enough that the, when you glue things together, you know, I mean, so this part is, is identified with this, and this is identified with this. So this part here is, is getting glued together here. Uh, so if you just want a topological manifold, it's enough that uh, that map will be continuous. Uh, if you want something more, if you want it to be uh, differentiable, so you can do calculus on, on this space, then you would need this, this map to be uh, infinitely differentiable or smooth. Um, and, and maybe if you want it to be real analytic, you can take analytic functions as well. Okay, um, now uh, we're going to eventually get to quaternions, but first of all, uh, the first step is to go to complex geometry. So for, for a complex manifold, you'd want to take open subsets inside of CN instead. So open subsets. And then the gluing map would be from an open subset in CN to another open subset in CN. And um, if you want to study uh, a, a complex manifold, you'd want, you'd want that map to be holomorphic, so that it makes sense to talk about holomorphic functions on the space. Um, and if you change from, from one chart to another, a um, you know, function that's holomorphic in, in one one set of coordinates is still holomorphic in the next set of coordinates. So you need the, the, uh, the gluing maps to be, be holomorphic to get there. Okay, so what does holomorphic mean? Uh, um, if, you, if you look at Cauchy-Riemann equations, what they're really saying is that um, if you take the, the differential of, of your map, so from uh, tangent space to another tangent space, then I mean, these are now just vector spaces, and you want this map to be complex linear. That's exactly what Cauchy-Riemann equations are if you write them out. So how do you then get to the quaternionic, um, quaternionic manifolds? So that the, what, you, what you might try first of all is to take uh, open subsets inside quaternionic vector space of dimension here. Mm. And then your gluing map, you want the gluing map to be sort of quaternionic analytic. Mm. And so what would that mean? That would mean that the, the differential of that, the map of the level of tangent spaces, should be uh, quaternion linear. Mm. Okay. So you can, you, can try, you can try that. Um, and but it's only going to get you uh, so far because um, unlike uh, the Cauchy-Riemann equations, these sort of quaternionic linear equations like this are really overdetermined. If you try to solve these equations, um, there's way more. There's, there's basically too many equations, and uh, the only solutions would be that the gluing maps themselves are linear, or or or, or, or affine, so uh, linear plus a translation. Um, so you can do this, but it gives you a, fairly, a very limited set of examples. Um, and basically, from affine map, you can get examples like um, uh, you take the turning effect of space and you push it out uh, a lattice inside there, kind of a, a torus uh, with a quaternion on structure. But it's not, not a particularly interesting example. And just using affine maps it's, it's, it's to glue things together, you, you get a fairly limited set of examples. Okay, so what, what else can you, you try? 
Well, there's another way to describe uh, complex manifolds, and um, that is that if you, if you have uh, local holomorphic coordinates on your manifold, then um, infinitesimally on the level of the tangent space, the tangent space would be a complex vector space. Okay? Um, so a weaker notion is the idea of an almost complex structure. An almost complex structure is just saying that um, you have your manifold and then on, on, the, tangent, on, the, on the tangent bundle, you have a, a map from the tangent bundle to itself, um, which we call i. And that's and the square is the minus the identity. So that's like the complex multiplication for all the tangent states. Okay, so an almost complex structure would just mean that uh, on each, tan each tangent space is a complex vector space. So on each tangent space, you have a notion of uh, multiplication by i. So a, a, a complex manifold is, is more than that, because on a complex manifold, it's not just um, in each tangent space you have a complex structure. You actually have local complex coordinates on it. And what that means is that these local um, complex structures on, on each tangent space, they fit together in a nice way. And there's, there's a theorem that describes how we get that. Um, there's, uh, once you have your, your almost complex structure, there's another tensor you can derive from that called the Nienhaus tensor. And it's the vanishing of this tensor that ensures that you actually have local complex coordinates, local holomorphic coordinates. And this is the, um, the statement of the, the famous of Newland and Nuremberg theorem. Okay, so you can do the same now with uh, quaternions. You, you take your, your manifold, uh, which is a smooth manifold, and on each tangent, you could say, let's make each tangent space into a quaternionic vector space. Okay, so that would mean that um, on each tangent space, you have a multiplication by i, j, and k. And um, but on the whole manifold, you would have, therefore, these, uh, uh, these tensors that uh, i, j, and k, that at each tangent space, they're giving a multiplication by i, j, and k. Okay, so each, each, uh, each tangent space is now quaternionic. And what about each probability? Uh, so, um, yeah, so what, what you would want then is that um, for them to, to fit together in a nice way, you say, well, let's, let's ask that each of these complex structures i, j, and k be integrable in this sense. So that each one of them, um, from i, you get local complex coordinates i, local complex coordinates j, for j, and local complex coordinates for, for k. Um, now, actually, the interesting thing here is that that doesn't, uh, that doesn't imply that you have local quaternionic coordinates in, in the sense we described earlier. As we said earlier, that's, that was a very limited example. This is, this is slightly more general than that already. Okay, and of course you have to satisfy these uh, usual compatibility between i, j, and k. So an example of this would be uh, the hop surface where you take the quaternions, you remove uh, the origin, a zero, in there, and then you quotient out by an equivalence relation which um, says that any quaternion is equivalent to lambda times a quaternion, where lambda is some, some fixed uh, quaternion um, with norm of, uh, greater than, than 1. Okay. So there's a, there's, a weaker, um, there's a weaker integrability condition that you can, uh, you can ask for instead, um, which gives the notion of what we just call a quaternionic manifold. Um, in this, this case, again, you have these uh, uh, almost complex structures i, j, and k, um, but this time they're only locally defined. So in each open set, uh, each local neighborhood, you have these um, almost complex structures i, j, and k. And uh, to what replaces the integrability condition, instead of saying that they all give actual complex structures, um, you, you say that um, the, what's preserved is the um, subspace of endomorphisms of, of the tangent bundle, generated by i, j, and k. So i, j, and k are, are each giving endomorphisms of the tangent bundle, and together they, they generate a three-dimensional uh, sub-bundle sub inside here. And um, if, if we were... Um, and that's the thing it, that sort of knits it together, this endomorphisms of the tangent bundle? Yeah, will, yeah so th will, these, uh, this is the, the quaternionic structure, but it's... it's uh, um, but it's, if, if you said this, Set this all to be zero, then you would have like the integrability like yeah, last. Yeah. So this is this is slightly weaker in saying that um, as you move around, the i i could be changing a little bit, but it only changes by adding in a bit of j and k. So you sort of, I mean, in the end, this is like just rotating the quaternions as you move around. So the vector and scalar parts are sort of 
distinguish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you you um, you can't say at each point you can't say definitely which is i j or k, but you know you have i j and k. Yeah. And if you if you if you, if you pick if you pick one of them, I mean you can you can choose inside there. And let's make this i j and k, but you don't know a priori uh, which which one. So this is sort of the rotated by quaternions that you can pull out. So an interesting example of this is quaternion on the projective space. You take a n plus one dimensional quaternions and you quotient out by uh, by scalars. And uh, interestingly, this is not this is not um, um, hyper complex in the in the previous uh, definition, um, but it does give an example of one of these uh, quaternionic manifolds. Um, you can see that it's not it's not um, it's not um, hyper complex because the the, the lowest dimensional example HP one that's just actually a four dimensional sphere, and uh, only S two has Complex structure or S6, I guess, but it's known that only S2 and S6 have almost complex structures. It's not known whether S6 has an actual complex structure. Certainly, S4 doesn't have a complex structure, so it can't be hyper complex. Okay, um, I just wanted to mention quickly an interesting way to study these uh, examples is to use complex geometry. Even though, we, I mean, we have i, j, and k, so we have a lot of complex structures, um, but you don't have uh, quaternion column, you don't have Quaternionic analytic structures, but you can use just a whole uh, complex analytic structures instead. The way to do that is to, to combine all your your, um, your quaternions into uh, a larger space. So uh, maybe I'll just describe it. The simpler example is when you have a hyper complex manifold. Um, if you take any point x, y, z in the two sphere, then you get a new complex structure from uh, this, this uh, linear combination of i, j, and k, and so you get actually a whole s two worth of complex structures, these are just the unit imaginary quaternions uh, acting, on, acting on M. So you can actually, if you combine them all, you take your original space and you cross it with S2. On this space you can put a, a complex structure where it's kind of varying as you move around in S2. Uh, so the complex structure on the M part varies as you move around in S2. And so doing, doing that you get a, a complex manifold. And uh, that's called the twister space of the M. So, for example, for this quaternionic projective space, um, the, the twister space is the 2n plus 1 complex dimension projective space. And this, so, this is an S2 bundle over here. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting geometry goes that, that uh, you can deduce from this. Studying differential equations on, on here can often be translated into studying holomorphic equations up here, and that's often easier. So this is the whole sort of Penrose twister twister program, but it's yeah. applied in the uh, uh, Romanian setting as, as well. Okay, so actually let me let me come to Romanian geometry now. So in Romanian geometry, you have also a metric. Now earlier on, I mentioned that uh, a quaternionic manifold, you have this connection, um, and the connection is describing uh, sort of the differentiation, and it allows you to to um, parallel transport vectors around your, your manifold. Um, a stronger notion is, is that of, of a Romanian metric. You actually have distances and uh, angles inside your vector spaces. Um, so that's the Romanian structure uh, G, Romanian metric G. And uh, once you have a, a Romanian structure, then again you have a connection. So it's a levi jupiter connection. It's the unique um, torsion-free connection uh, compatible with the, with the metric. Um, so it's, so, so now we can take the earlier structures and add in the, the metric and ask for some compatibility with those. So if you start with a quaternionic manifold and now you add a metric and ask that the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, almost complex structures i, j, and k are compatible with, with g, um, then, then what that means is that you would ask that the connection you get from, from your the metric is, um, uh, preserves this, is, is the metric which preserves it, this three-dimensional subbundle of metamorphism. There's another way to describe this, which is uh, via uh, what we call holonomy. So holonomy is, is when you start on, you start at a point, you take a vector here, and you have a, a metric, so you have a, a connection. The connection allows you to transport a vector along a path in a parallel manner. It tells you when, you know, when that would be parallel, transported par parallel. It you know, says, so connection is telling you if you have two nearby vector spaces, how to identify them. So if you start with a vector here, and you, you translate it along this way, and then up here, and then back to the same point, uh, in general, it doesn't come back to the same vector. You can see, in this example, you see that it would be rotated. And so if you're in n dimensions, um, you get a subgroup of, uh, of Rn. Uh, in this 
because we're in the end of quaternionic dimensions, actually four end real dimensions. Uh, so the, the vector would get transformed by some element in the, the general linear group of four n by four n matrices. Uh, if you take all possible paths and parallel transport around all of them, you get a subgroup of, of GLN4R, GL4NR. GL four N R. And uh, the turning on manifold is when the, the subgroup is this product of the, uh, the turning on unitary group of, of orders N and 1. Okay. Uh, so there was a, a classification by, by Marcel Berger, and he, um, he wrote down all the different groups that arise as holonomy groups. And um, so this is, this is one of them, the, uh, and this corresponds to the, this, this quaternionic uh, uh, K-less structure on this space. OK, so some examples of these spaces, uh, they come from symmetric spaces. This is when you take a Lie group and uh, a Borel, Lie group and a Borel or parabolic subgroup inside there. And um, these are very algebraic examples, very, very um, have a lot of symmetry, and um, if you're asking for examples of Quaternion and Kähler uh, symmetric spaces, then they're basically classified by um, uh, Cartan's uh, classification of, of uh, Lie groups and Lie algebras from the 1920s or so. And so you can write down all the symmetric spaces which have this Quaternion and Kähler structure. And you, get, you get this list, in these families, of the different families of examples, plus some uh, uh, exceptional examples corresponding to exceptional uh, the, the articles. Um, so these are all the examples with uh, positive scalar curvature. And um, there's a conjecture that, um, conversely, every quaternion Kähler manifold with positive scalar curvature that's complete is, is symmetric, is one of these uh, examples on here. This has been true to, uh, proof of dimensions 4 and 8, but it's still, it's still open in higher dimensions. Okay, so that's uh, when we start with the quaternionic manifold and add in the Romanian metric. Uh, the other thing we can do is start with the hypercomplex manifold. So remember, that's when you have this, this triple IJK and actual complex structures on your space. Now, if you add in a metric and ask that it be um, compatible with IJ and K, um, compatibility uh, of a metric with a complex structure is the Kähler condition. Um, and so that, that means that the um, multiplying by, by I on the tangent space preserves length. It's just a rotation in, in the tangent space. And um, uh, the additional thing is you need the uh, um, you need the connection coming from the metric to preserve uh, preserve I, I, J, and K as well. Um, so you get the, the, the stronger equilibrium condition we talked about earlier. Um, in terms of homology, it's saying that the uh, homology is contained in this quaternionic unitary group. So. And again, this is one of the groups on, on Berger's list. So I uh, see that he gave a list of the different kinds of holonomy groups that can rise. And then later on, uh, people work very hard to find examples that, that had, had those holonomy groups. Now, um, in this case, I mean, because you have uh, IJ and K integrable, then you have local, well, you have, you have, holo you have uh, holomorphic coordinates on these, these spaces. So if you just fix one of the complex structures, say I, you can write down holomorphic coordinates anywhere on your manifold with respect to I. And so you can use complex geometry to, to study these examples. And um, in, in particular, you have these different Kähler forms. If, so if you, if you look at the, the complex stru structure with respect to I, then the other two Kähler forms can be combined into a, a complex Kähler form. This turns out to be a, a complex symplectic structure. So it's like the, the complex analog of a symplectic structure. And um, using this, you can find uh, um, examples of, of these spaces. Um, you, you can actually get right back to um, uh, complex algebraic geometry. And so you're looking for, for complex projective varieties that have a, 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 a um, holomorphic symplectic structure on them. And I mean, it's not, it's not very easy to find examples, but once you have the holomorphic structure, then uh, there are theorems that tell you that, in fact, you have this, this metric and the whole uh, Hypercalar structure as well. The, the whole hypercalar structure turns out to be very transcendental, but um, but the, the complex structure and the, the holomorphic symplectic structure um, uh, can be can be completely algebraic. So here's some examples, and if you're familiar with algebraic geometry, maybe uh, um, some of these will, will make sense. Um, 
Otherwise, uh, I guess we'd, we'd be too pressed to, find it, to describe it in detail. Um, but I want to just finish with um, uh, um, uh, some results about um, you know, applying the, the quaternionic structure in, in a way. So how, how do you actually use the, the quaternionic structure to, to study these spaces? Uh, well, in a Kähler manifold, if you have this, the, uh, the Kähler twofold, um, this acts on forms and, and, and um, cohomology groups. And um, the, the left chess theorems say that um, if you, you have this operation of, of taking a, a form and wedging with the, uh, the Kähler form, this twofold, and it raises a degree, there's an adjoint to that which takes you back down uh, two degrees. And then there's another operator which is just modeling by a scalar. And together, these three give the action of, of a Lie Liadra SL2 on the whole cohomology ring. And so you can decompose the cohomology ring as, as irreducible representations of SL2. On a hyper Kähler manifold, you have so much more because you have this, this triple of Kähler structures now. So you have the, the left shift operators from those and their adjoints. And together, all, all of these generate uh, uh, action of a slightly larger uh, Liadra on the, on the uh, cohomology. Um, and in fact, you can even go further than that. As you, as you vary the metric, you, you get even more. Um, you can change the metric, and then you get another set of, uh, of uh, quaternions. And uh, so you get you generate this, this, this much larger uh, the algebra acting on the whole cohomology ring. Right. So now, decomposing this in terms of those representations, um, you, can, you can prove things about the topology of the spaces you have. So, uh, in dimension eight, you can show that the, the second cohomology is bounded by, by 23, and um, in dimensions 12, um, you can show that you get that same bound in 23 dimensions. So the idea is you take the the um, the, uh, the the uh, the Hodge diamond, which describes all the cohomology, and then you decompose that into highest weight representations of that, that largely the algebra. So in dimensions 12, you get these irreducible representations, and um, and so you get very precise control over the. Uh, um, so you can sort of encode all of the topology in terms of just these yeah. six modules, and then it gives bounds on the, on the topology. Okay, so it sounds like I'm out of time. So, can, so, so thank shop, you very much. Shop, sorry about that. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, does anybody have any questions? Any questions for um, for Justin? Okay, then we have another, we're going to have another talk. So, 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 so just one, just one. Yes, okay, uh, great. So, so, so it seems to me that, I'm just right, so on the, on the high level, what do you get by, by having this sort of quaternion, almost quaternionic structure on the manifold that, that you don't have when you don't have it? What do you get? Yeah. Uh, it, so as I, as I said in the introduction, just, the, this yeah. structure arises very naturally in a lot yeah. of, uh, Physical situations. Like, I think that, uh, I mean, I suspect the reason is because if you start with um, uh, space time, it, it's, it's four dimensional so, and it sort of has this sort of, you can put it's natural quaternionic structure. structure on it. Well, that's the sort of Lorentzian case, we're looking at the Romanian case. But it, again, you still, you know, if you're looking at, at um, solutions of uh, equations on, on a four dimensional space, like instantons yeah. or something, then then um, you can put a quaternionic structure on that, and then the spaces you study have this quaternionic structure. And so it tells you things about the dimension, the topology that you wouldn't know if you if, if you if you if you, didn't, if you didn't have that. Thank you. But, excuse me. Yeah. But quaternionic, uh, quaternionic structure it only could be applied to the space. It's not time because it's different metric. Sorry. Space time yeah. has metric three. Right, yeah, that's, what I'm saying. that's the Lorentzian. Uh, it's just Lorentzian. rotations. Yeah. So it's positive definite yeah. metric. Yeah, that's, that's the Lorentzian case. So uh, yeah, this is the, the Romanian case. case yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to have our next talk. Yeah, but you can work for the street.